these next five weeks in the lead up to Easter, I think will be the kinds of sermons and studies we do in our discipleship groups that you'll come back to over and over and over again for the rest of your life. We're going to be looking at, and I'm trying to like oversell it. I'm trying to exactly accurately sell it. We're going to be looking at five assurances, not all of the assurances we have, the five assurances we have in Jesus. The assurance of salvation today, assurance of forgiveness, assurance of victory, assurance of answered prayer, and assurance of guidance. And it is, I say with full confidence that each one of us has struggled with one of or multiple of those assurances at some stage in our lives. And so we're gonna be looking at over the next five weeks how Scripture and the Spirit gives us confidence, in fact, assurance in those five areas. And my hope is that this will be a great foundation for us, you know, for the rest of our lives. But then also when we get to times in our lives where we are wondering or wondering, we can come back and anchor into the person and work of Jesus um, because of these assurances we have in Him. So let me pray. Again, talked it up a lot, Harold, for your sermon today. But, but in full confidence. Let's, let's pray. And so, Father, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. Thank you that we as a family are growing in your providence. We celebrate that today. Uh, Newish, thank you that uh, we are a group of sent ones. We celebrate that with um, more church planting in your providence and in your will. Thank you for newness of life and the celebration of um, regeneration, which we're celebrating next Sunday with baptisms. You're just so good to us. God, thank you for, for calling us into your kingdom and into your family and making us your daughters and your sons. Thank you for acting upon us or towards us with favour and love and joy and not treating us how we deserve or how we feel on any given day, but according to your goodness and the riches of your mercy. God, you're so good to us. Help us as we hear from Scripture today that your Spirit, my request is that your Spirit would do his work in our hearts and our minds, conforming us more to the likeness of Jesus, helping us to love you and one another uh, ever more like your Son, and that we would have the full assurance of our salvation because of what Jesus has done. In his name we pray. Amen. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, thanks Don. And um, uh, Don didn't want to oversell it, but uh, I'll try and oversell it. That uh, um, 50 years ago, when I first came to know Jesus, my friend who helped me uh, get into the scriptures and come to meet Jesus gave me these five uh, uh, promises, assurances, certainty about God of salvation and answered prayer and, and so on. And he gave me a little verse to memorise for each of those assurances. And uh, they've just become an incredible foundation uh, in my Christian life uh, over many years. And uh, so the, this morning, we want to think uh, about the gift of salvation, assurance of salvation. And um, as I uh, look back in my life, um, I've received many presents. My, uh, I know I can be quite different from the rest of you, but I do enjoy getting presents, getting gifts. And, um, and my father, uh, who was a refugee from Latvia after World War II, uh, told us that in Latvia, you not only have um, Christmas and birthdays, but you also have names days. And so if your name is John, well, in the middle of the year, you get a names day. So you get presents, you get gifts on your names day, your birthday, and even Christmas, you get the presents given to you on New Year, uh, Christmas Eve. You don't even have to wait till, uh, till uh, Christmas Day. But I, I want to say to you that today that really... The greatest gift that I have ever received is the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And, and the, 
the second greatest gift that I've ever received was the gift of being certain about eternal life, to being certain about assurance, to have an assurance that God has forgiven me and given me his righteousness. And uh, 1 John 5, 13, I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not so that you may hope so, but that you may know, to be fully assured. And, and that's what we want to talk about over the next five weeks, these, these certainties, these assurances, because we can try and live the Christian life without that certainty. And God never intended that, we, that the Christian life should be, well, I, I hope so, I'll, I'll just try harder. God just longs for us to live in the certainty of what he's done, who he is and what he's done. So your first reaction to, to, to me could be, well, that's pretty presumptuous to think that you can be certain about eternal life. You know, that's, you're pretty proud, aren't you? And, um, and uh, well, let's go to our Bible reading this morning and we'll see what uh, God says in 1 John 5. We're going to read uh, 1 John 5 from verse uh, 5 to verse uh, 14. Who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus Christ. He is the one who came by water and blood, not by water only, but by water and by blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept human testimony, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that he is given about his son. The one who believes in the son of God has this testimony within himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked from him. There's lots of knowing, lots of certainty, lots of confidence. And that's how God longs for us to live, to experience the Christian life. There's a little spot on the university campus on North Terrace. Um, they haven't put a memorial plaque there, but um, at this spot one day about uh, 50 years ago, I was on my way back for lunch in North Adelaide and a Christian on campus approached me and said, would, uh, would I mind answering some questions about Jesus and about Christianity? And I was open to anything at that stage in my life as, as a matter of fact, looking back, there was a deep emptiness in my life, but I didn't know why there was that emptiness. And uh, he said, well, do you believe in God? And, uh, and I said, uh, yeah, yeah, but he's, he's just very distant, very distant, a long way away. And, and what about Jesus? Oh, yeah, I, I believe he existed. And what about eternal life? And uh, I gave my first uh, false gospel sermon back to him. I, I, I said, well, you can never be sure. You can never be certain. Well, as we're saying this morning, you can never have assurance. If you're good enough, you'll get it. And if you're not good enough, you'll miss out. And uh, he, he very wisely uh, didn't argue with me. He just, uh, and uh, you'll be pleased, no, I'm not going to preach the same sermon this morning. Um, he said, uh, why don't we look into the Bible and see what God has to say about eternal life and coming to receive eternal life? 
And uh, we did. And it was a beautiful thing. So I want to talk with you firstly this morning about why assurance is so important for us as believers, as followers of Jesus. And then to look at how we can really grow in that assurance, in that certainty. And, and firstly, assurance really reflects my understanding of God, of what God is like, who he is like as a person. You know, God is just so certain. We, we can be so whimsical, saying we're going to do one thing one day and doing another thing tomorrow, and we, we can just be all over the place. And back in the Old Testament, when uh, Israel was coming out of Egypt, some of, the, um, some of the countries started to see what God was doing and they got really scared. And uh, a fellow called Balak um, commissioned a man called Balaam to go and curse Israel and stop them. And, um, and he would have paid him a lot of money to do it. And uh, Balaam, who was sort of a prophet in touch with God, uh, he just had to say what God told him to say. And he said, Balak, in Numbers 23, you can look it up later if you like, but Numbers 23, 18 to 20, Balak, get up and listen. Pay attention. God is not a, God is not a man that he should lie. God's not the son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have indeed received a command to bless and since he is blessed, I can't change it. And I think assurance begins first of all with us seeing what God is like. That when God makes a promise, he makes a promise. And, and he doesn't operate like us. I'm sure you've all promised a friend that you'll meet them at such and such a place or you'll do this for them or you, you'll go somewhere and either you totally forget about it, I often forget, and if it's not written down on the kitchen calendar and in my diary as well and five other places, I forget, or else you get sick, something happens, but nothing can stop God. God is not only willing to keep his promises, he's able. He says to his disciples, I don't know whether you've ever thought of this, back in Mark 4, he says to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And um, <clears throat> Jesus says that, there's nothing to stop him, but a storm comes and the disciples, they just go to pieces. They think Jesus doesn't care for them anymore. And, and he just speaks the word and the storm stops. And he's saying, where is your faith? It's assurance is based on faith, but not just faith. It's faith in God. God who always keeps his promises. God, nothing can stop God from keeping his promises. In Romans 8, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? God wants us to live in the certainty that what he promises, he will fulfill and nothing can stop him. Jesus gave, had the picture, gave us the picture of him as the shepherd. My, my sheep in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Sometimes when I was growing up, my father would have something in his hand and he'd ask me to guess which hand it was in and then he'd say, right, well now you've got to open the hand to get it. And, uh, and I'd just sort of uh, try and lift up one finger and then another finger and I knew he was letting me do it. You know, I didn't have a hope of getting it out if, uh, unless he let me. And, but what I want us to know is that when we come to Jesus, we're held in his hand and nothing is greater. 
Nothing can take us out of his hand forever. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And that's on God's heart. He doesn't want us to live in a family where we don't know that we really belong. He wants us to live in his family and he not only wants us to live in his family but to know that we belong in our hearts because of his promises toward us. So assurance <clears throat> reflects my understanding of who God is but it also reflects my understanding of the gospel. The gospel that I once believed is no gospel. It's not good news. If you are trying to get to heaven based on your own efforts, you can never have any assurance. You can never know whether you're going to be good enough. You only have to be married. Your wife will tell you that you're not, you're not good enough on a lot of things. Your kids, <clears throat> your kids as they grow up will point out a lot of things. It doesn't take much, and then, apart from all your friends. But the true gospel is a gospel of certainty. That Jesus died on the cross and he said it is finished. But the problem is we have a big misunderstanding about the gospel and we think that the gospel is about ticking some boxes and signing it and we don't realise that first of all, the gospel of Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead is that so that I can enter in to a new relationship with God. Jesus himself said this is eternal life in John 17 3 that they may know you the only true God and the one you've sent Jesus Christ. I'd always thought of eternal life as um, you know something at the end you know if you've been good enough you'll get in to heaven. And, and God says, no, eternal life is coming to know Jesus personally. And yes, there's going to be a little bump in the road when we die physically. But we go to be with Jesus and when we come to him, we enter in to life with him. God makes a promise in John 5, 24. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes on him that sent me, has eternal life. The verse doesn't say, will get it when you die. It's present tense. Has eternal life. Has entered into a relationship with Jesus. And will not come into judgment. There won't be a judgment when you come to Jesus. There won't be a judgment as to whether you have life or death. That's already been solved, resolved when we come to Jesus and his work on the cross. But has passed from life, from death to life. It, it's a beautiful verse to meditate on. It's a beautiful promise to take for assurance. You've got to test the gospels that you hear. And one of the key verses for me is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that's not from yourselves, not from our own efforts. It's a gift from God. That's why we started talking about gifts at the beginning. Not of works that no one can boast. The problem is it, it grates against my pride to think that I have to humble myself and receive a gift. Or even worse, you know, you picture someone giving you a gift and you say, how much do I owe you? It must grieve God's heart when he wants to give us the gift of eternal life and we try and respond by saying, oh yeah, well, I'll, I'll earn it, I'll earn it. You know, I, I used to uh, drive into work every morning in the city <clears throat> and uh, park up near Hyde Marsh Square haven't had to do it for a long time, but, <clears throat> but they opened up a new car park one morning and, um, <clears throat> and they had a sign, uh, free car parking. 
and uh, <clears throat> I was always open to uh, getting something for nothing. And uh, <clears throat> so I drove in and the fellow at the gate said, uh, oh yeah, first week it's uh, free. We'll only start charging you next week. So I thought, good. <clears throat> so I just drove in and parked. And as I was getting out of the car, someone else drove in and uh, the fellow said, yeah, free. It's free this week. And uh, they started to argue and said, oh, surely it can't be free. What, you know, what's the catch? And he said, oh, no, we're just marketing the car park. We want people to come here. No, it can't be. It can't be. And the person in the car got so mad, they backed out and went off elsewhere. <laughs> and I thought, <clears throat> we don't like to receive a gift. Something, sin has done something in our lives that we don't like to receive something. We fight it. We, but God says, humble yourself like a child and acknowledge your deep need. It's not presumption to say I've received a gift. It's simply God's way of salvation is to receive the gift of eternal life, of his righteousness. I'm not saying that there won't be doubts and fears that come in, but we've got to keep coming back to the promises that God has given to us. And when we fail and when we sin, you know, I usually um, end up having, uh, every time I come to preach, I usually end up having an argument with my wife the day before I get up to preach. There's always something, you know, that can put you off preaching or, you, you know, or we fall, we fail. And God says, don't despair. Remember the gospel, that we have an advocate who's ever pleading for us, that we can come to him and confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. It's on our heart that all of you will have a confidence in what Jesus has done, that it won't be, I hope so, but I know so, not because of anything in me, but because he's given me a gift and I've received it. Assurance is all about who God is. It's all about his promises toward us. It's all about the gospel, the true gospel. And, and it's all about how do we face the battle, the spiritual battle. Because the devil just loves to bring in fears and doubts you know, surely, surely you're not saved. You know, the church doesn't really know what I was like. The church doesn't know the depth of my sin. But God knows. And he's the one that counts. And he's the one that says, in Christ, all our sins are forgiven. Past, present, future, all our sins are forgiven. That he might, in Hebrews 2 that he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who are held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. The gospel came to the Thessalonians in full assurance. And that's what we long for each of you, that there will come not only the gospel into your lives, but it'll come with full assurance with full certainty of what God has done. There's a beautiful verse in Acts 2. Preach, uh, Peter is preaching and he says, Repent and be baptised, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. I was one of those who was afar off. In time, 2,000 years later, in location all the way over in Australia, and God cared for me. He said, my promise of salvation is not just for, you, for those who were there at the time, but it's for all who are afar off. We thank God for his grace. It's amazing. So how do we grow in this assurance? 
God testifies. God gives us promises. And he wants us to take those promises seriously in our lives. And, and so he says in 1 John 5, 9, the witness of God which he has testified of his son. And so we've got to keep coming back to what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And when doubts come in, when I don't think I'm worthy, he went to the cross because no one was worthy. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And every one of us is going to have doubts and feelings that, of inadequacy. God doesn't say you shouldn't feel like that. God says, keep coming back to the cross and to what Jesus has done for you. He was condemned for me. He closed an infinite gap. As it says in Colossians 2.13, he's forgiven all my sins. But there's something, something more that it's not just looking back at what Jesus has done for me, his work for me, but it's the witness of the Spirit of God within in verse 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. In some ways, <clears throat> it's a bit like if you've ever travelled. Uh, when I first went to Europe, I, <clears throat> I travelled through all these countries where there was no English and you had to use sign language and <clears throat> all sorts of things to get through. And finally, I got to Dover and I sat in the railway station and I could understand the announcements. I could understand the people as they walked past. And I want to say that the witness of the Spirit of God within is the witness that the Holy Spirit helps us to take these promises that God has given us and, and he confirms them in our life. He gives us this deep inner certainty that what God has said is true and that he will keep his promises. I mean, that's why we're so keen for all of you as a church to have a regular reading of the scriptures. You know, the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible and, and it's, a, it's like one of those book club meet the authors where as you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is present, present within your life and he can explain the scriptures to you and make them real and make his promises real to you that they become personal promises to you so that you can say when doubts come in he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me might have eternal life no has eternal life and the Holy Spirit bears witness within your heart that this is true. The Spirit himself, as it says in Romans 8, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know, sometimes we like to be a bit black and white about this and sometimes people impose <clears throat> certain things about the Holy Spirit that are not right. But I want to say to you that sometimes people can become Christians but they may not have a deep inner certainty but that's where God wants to bring us and I know for me I believe I became a Christian but it was probably about five years later that as I was memorizing Romans 8 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and I still condemned myself, even though I had no basis for it. And God said to my heart, the Spirit said, why are you still condemning yourself when God is no longer condemning yourself? And, and it just, I believe that was the inner witness of the Spirit of God confirming his word, his promises to us. And, and there's always a danger that people will say, <clears throat> well, I've prayed the sinner's prayer. I've, 
I've ticked the box. I, I go to church. But it's not just assurance has to be more than simply ticking a box. And that's why we're talking about a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus, the witness of the Spirit of God within, makes it real. I remember we did a Bible study with a man many years ago and he made a decision, he said the words that he wanted to follow Jesus. But it was like it was only words. He could never really call God Father. And I'm not saying that that's the test, but you just sensed that he'd never really entered in to that personal living relationship. And God wants us to live in that certainty, not just because of what Jesus has done for us, but also the witness of the Spirit of God within us. So his work for me, his, his witness within me, and, and his word to me. In 2 Peter 1, 3 <clears throat> and 4, he says, By these he has given us very great and precious promises. God has given us many promises and it, it, it's great for you as you read through the Bible to say what is God promising here? Now I'm still looking for the promise where he'll make me a millionaire but he does promise to meet my every need and I'm look, still looking for the promise where nothing wrong will ever happen but he promises never to leave me and these five assurances, as Don said, they're not the only assurances, but they're five key, beautiful assurances that will establish us and give us a confidence in walking with God. And this was the verse, these verses in 1 John 5 were the verses that really helped me with an assurance. He who has the Son has life. I'd always thought it was he who tries to live a good life has life. He who works hard, he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. How do we help others? I think we have to be very careful not to tell people that they've got eternal life. That's the job of God's promises and the Holy Spirit within. We can emphasise God's promises, but we long for everyone to be taught of God because that's what's going to enable people to hold on. Not something we've said, not something we've told them, but an assurance based on who God is and his word and his work and the inner witness of the Spirit of God. So that's on our heart as we, we've really only scratched the surface with assurance of salvation. When you come to your DGs, <clears throat> don't have a big argument about once saved, always saved. <clears throat> don't, don't get caught up in arguments. Come back to are we learning to live by the word of God, to live by his promises, to believe him, that God always keeps his promises. He's a faithful God. And uh, we're just so thankful. Encourage each other in how great, how faithful our God is. Amen. Let's just thank the Lord. Father, <clears throat> we're so thankful for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you are a faithful God and that you long for us to live in this assurance. So we pray, Father, that you'll continue to help us to grow in this certainty, this life of confidence. We, uh, as we come around the Lord's table, help us to truly remember our Lord and rest in what he has done for us. Amen.